Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Drabble. Uh, I'm a Chartered Civil Engineering <coughs> Project Director. I first lived in Rutland from 1969 to 74, and I returned to live in Rutland in 2000. The question which I would like to ask relates to one out of a dozen possible greenfield sites put forward by Wissendine landowners, and it's denoted as 09A, and you all, most of you have a photograph and I've done a photograph to show this particular site, which gives context. And this site is provisionally allocated into the local plan. Um, to facilitate clear understanding, I will summarise the context and then ask the question. But could you move to your question? Sorry. I, will, I will move to the question. Sorry, could you move to your question, yes. please? Yes, okay. May I give a, a, a half a minute of context first? Uh, no, I, I, you've introduced yourself. I think. That is sufficient context. We understand where you're from and who you are, and that's all, all that needs to be known. I think we just want a question now, please. Okay. Given the facts of the context which I would have explained, the key question is why does the local plan seek to develop and thereby to harm this historical landscape, especially when there are other sites available? Within this question, why are there errors in the emissions in some studies? Um, sorry, Mr. Drabble, I, I hate to interrupt you again, and apologies for that, but you do have to read the question as submitted to us. I see. Please. Okay. In that case, I will do so. I tried to put in some context to make it easy for people to pick up. Would you like a copy of 
with your question? No, I, I have it here, thank you. Okay, all local and national policies seek to preserve and conserve landscapes with historical and heritage value, including the national planning policy framework, Russian County Council's policies, and natural England's policies, and the draft local, explan local plan itself, especially where other sites are available. So again, why has uh, Rutland County Council proposed to develop and thereby to harm or destroy a landscape on this site where, where well-preserved and high-quality medieval ridge and furrow landscape is a prominent heritage feature when there are other sites available? The Historic Environment Records Office confirms that this is a site of selected heritage inventory for natural England, reference LE7796, with high significance because of its heritage value with well-preserved medieval ridge and furrow landscape. Contributor to this, why has um, Rutland County Council failed to correct some important mistakes in their landscape sensitivity and capacity study after they have been advised in writing since corrected inputs show that this is a low to medium capacity site and this leads to a different ranking of sites for allocation. And further contributing to this, why does the sustainability assessment fail to recognize or describe and account for the historic and heritage nature of this site's um, landscape? That completes the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you will appreciate that it is a, a technical and detailed question, and as a consequence, I have asked officers to prepare a response which I will read out now. As chairman of the Growth Infrastructure and Resources Scrutiny Committee, I must advise the questioner that I was not involved in the production of the papers before us tonight. However, I have asked the officers who were responsible to provide a response which I am reading out. The planning policy team replied to Mr. Drabble on the 19th of August 2019 regarding his comments as follows. Your concerns were forwarded to the consultant Subsequently, they revisited the preparatory work undertaken during the preparation of the landscape sensitivity and capacity study of land around Wissendine. The consultant responded they were happy with their assessment of Zone W2 in the report, of which site WHI stroke 09A in the draft local plan forms a part. Is accurate and robust? The area that the council has identified as WHI stroke 09A is similar in character, landscape sensitivity and capacity as the majority of zone W2, which is relatively extensive, extending along the western edge of the village. The report acknowledged the different characteristics of the southern parts of the zone, but in general zone W2 consists of a number of small scale, relatively flat, regular, rectilinear paddocks separated by mostly tall, dense hedgerows with hedgerow trees, where ridge and furrow is a distinctive feature. The landscape character approach is used to assess landscape sensitivity and capacity to accommodate development. This <coughs> considers the often complex interrelationships of natural, cultural, social, perceptual and aesthetic influences together with consideration of settlement form and pattern and landscape value. The consultants, when making their recommendation to the council, have assessed landscape sensitivity and the capacity to accommodate development by using the landscape <coughs> approach, which considers often complex interrelationships of natural, cultural, social, perceptual and aesthetic influences. Together with taking into consideration the settlement form and pattern as well as landscape value. All these factors were taken into account when prioritising land for potential development. The report does acknowledge the presence of the well-preserved bridge and furrow system around most of the village. In accordance with the village design statement, this should be preserved where possible. However, any new development on the edge of the village is likely to affect ridge and furrow to some extent, which must be balanced with all other potential effects. For example, the report also acknowledges the main focal points within the village, being the windmill and church tower, views to which should not be affected by new development. 
A judgment has to be made in prioritising areas for potential development on the order that these could be brought forward for development in landscape and visual terms. There is often little to choose between some zones in terms of overall landscape sensitivity and capacity, although the assessments may differ on the impact on the specific criteria. So WH was assigned a slightly lower capacity due to its more open, exposed nature, where new development would be on land above 125 metres, uh, the approximate height of land within WIN stroke 09A, likely to create a new harsh built edge that would break the skyline, have an adverse impact on the setting of the village and the countryside, and impact on sensitive views to the windmill and church tower. The assessment of overall landscape sensitivity and landscape value is similar for Zone W2 and Zone WH8, which incorporates uh, WIN stroke O2 in the draft local plan, but on balance, a slightly higher capacity is allocated for Zone W2, recognising the presence of mature trees and hedgerows, which provide enclosure and would help to assimilate new development into the countryside, limiting impact on the setting of the village. Mitigation should ensure that visual intrusion of the new development within WIN stroke 09A into the countryside is acceptable and key views are retained. And they go on to say, hope you find this explanation helpful in understanding how the landscape capacity was considered and landscape areas prioritised for development. Uh, that is the answer to the question. Your question and the answer will be appended to the minutes of this meeting. I don't expect everybody to have taken that all down at the rate I was speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take all of that on board. Most of that I've, I was aware of uh, before because it's been under discussion. And um, may I have a one point for clarification? Um, you, you can have clarification, but it will have to be after the meeting. So if you'd like to email that through, we will get it for you. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's got to be conducted in a strong and supportive political and organisational culture 
one in which you can be forensic and you can be robust. So you need to be able to answer yes to that. The question I pose to you is, I am, are you comfortable that there's no negative behaviour impacting scrutiny? In my role, I've seen many crises. I've worked with people in crisis, sorry, and I've worked... Sorry, you had to read what you've submitted to Oh, us. I do apologise. Please. I will stick to the script. You've been on the script fairly well so far, but you're going off it now. Okay, sorry. Um, so you have to be comfortable that there is no bullying, inappropriate pressure, conflict of interest or corruption in the system. This is the good scrutiny guide saying this. Have you amplified the voices and concerns of the public accurate, accurately? Do you understand the depth of negative public feeling against the major change in policy from a successful and supported policy to a major larger developments in Rutland stance? What is the evidence? Is the need proven? You have to pass that test. Risks attendant adopting the plan are understood. Do we fully understand the risks, the irreversible impacts, reputation and financial, uh, and the attendant resource requirements on taking on this plan? Again, you have to answer yes or no. Are the benefits clear, and are the risks worth it for this plan? Um, have the benefits been identified fully in this radical change of policy? It is radical. <coughs> Does this plan enhance revenue, improve our services, and live up to the values that drive our special county? Uh, so I'm asking you this question. Will you be proud of the county, you know, changing as 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 proposed. I think really the so what for all of these five tests that you really need to be able to answer an emphatic yes to is that if you can't answer yes, you have to take action. If you have doubts, you've got to make recommendations to the cabinet today at this meeting. And if you can't make your mind up because of this pack of snow, then you have to Think about the look back test. Um, the look back test, you know, you need to be secure because you stick to you'll the be under scrutiny you have as well. To us. I said you need to stick to the words you have submitted. Oh, I did make a pun. So, if you need more time, you must secure that and ensure there is proper activity designed and scheduled to ensure you can do the job. Uh, you need to be secure if the look back test is um, You're out of time now. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. Anyway, I hope that helps. It's designed to help, it's not designed to be uh, obstructive. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you very thank you. much for your deputation. Panel, you are in, entitled to ask questions of deputies. Does anybody have a question? I would remind you, that, or I would suggest to you, that the questions actually are rhetorical, so I don't expect anyone to answer. Anybody got any questions? No? Thank you very much. Okay, hope it helps. Thanks. We now move on to the deputation from Mr. Smith. Could I remind you, Mr. Smith, to stick to the wording that you submitted to us? <coughs> Will do. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Tim Smith. I am Chairman of North Dutton Parish Council. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present this deputation. The definition of scrutiny is the careful and detailed examination of something in order to get information about it. The pre-submission local plan was published towards the end of last week all 966 pages on it. I have a Bible at home, and the Old Testament therein has less pages than that. I might add that after 2,000 years it's still been scrutinised. I don't think I'm alone in being sceptical about how anyone can make 
a careful and detailed examination of this document in the time given. I have attempted to read through this document as best I can in the time available, but I'm sure I have missed many important details. I have not been able to cross-reference all the evidence space that apparently backs up the recommendations made. One example is the sustainability appraisal for the local plan 2018-36, beginning page 349. This document alone requires detailed examination to appreciate its significance. For instance, it doesn't quite dismiss Wolfbox, as the pre-submission local plan suggests. This pre-submission local plan has a great deal of useful information within it, and credit to the officers of Rutland County Council for its production. It is also about the whole of Rutland, and both deserve fulsome scrutiny. However, it is heavily biased towards Sir George's barracks. The Spatial Strategy for Development, page 39, paragraph 48, states, the new garden community, St George's, will deliver a significant portion of the county's housing and employment development. The 2016 government guidance on locally led garden villages, towns and cities states, we expect expressions of interest to demonstrate a strong local commitment to delivery. Cross-reference that with question 9, page 75, of appendix 5, on the consultation responses to the local plan. The question was, do you support the proposed changes to the housing requirements set out? It states, a high proportion of residents, 95%, do not support the proposed changes. And the response of RCC? Noted. One would have thought that we need more recognition than that. This significant negative response should be subjected to significant scrutiny as to the reasons why, and this will take time. In the Local Government Association Guide, Accounts of Work on Scrutiny, it states, fundamentally, all scrutiny work must add value. It must make a positive contribution for the lives of local people and scrutiny committee members must be very clear about how their work will do this. To make a positive contribution, you, the scrutiny panel, need sufficient time. I end with the following hope. Scrutiny works well when the council's executive views it in a positive light and has an opportunity to improve council performance. Scrutiny's effectiveness will be reduced if the executive sees it as aggressively critical, which will lead to defensive behaviour and make it difficult for scrutiny to influence change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, members of the panel, do you have any questions of Mr. Smith? No? Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Smith, you. for your time. That is the end of the deputations for this evening. We did have a question at short notice, and I would like um, to ask Cathy William to come and read out the question. I'm going to read that. Oh, all right, Mr. Milne. Uh, got that. Uh, my name is Norman Milne, uh, Chairman of Councillors. Uh, you'll be delighted to know this is quite a short question. Um, Roger Ransom, in his recent presentation to a parish council forum, uh, that was last Monday, repeatedly emphasised that we should count this time prior to the consultation period on the local plan, 10 February to 24th of March, as a 
additional time to read and digest the thousand plus pages on the local plan so we can come to an informed decision. With this in mind, I'd like, if, like to ask if the members of the scrutiny committee can honestly say with hand on heart that they've been given adequate time to come to the same informed conclusions considering the fact that they only have had approximately 11 days to complete what has been suggested by Mr. Ransom will take more than eight weeks. If the answer to that question is anywhere near no, then I, can I respectfully ask that this committee make the following twofold recommendations to Cabinet. Number one, the extension be given to this scrutiny process. Number two, an extension be given to the public consultation period to bring it in line with the 11 week period that was suggested that the process would take. That's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Mill. Now, uh, members of the public who may not be used to these um, meetings, the questions are actually questions of the chairman. And this question is largely about uh, process. I'm sure members of the panel may wish to comment in, the, uh, in this meeting, or not. They may wish to go away and reflect on it. Uh, but as it is a process question, I would like uh, to ask the Chief Executive uh, to give the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the legal requirement for the publication of committee agendas and papers is five clear working days. The agenda and papers for this scrutiny meeting were sent out on Wednesday the 8th of January, providing six clear working days plus a weekend, so it actually exceeds the statutory requirement. The decision about publishing the local plan for Regulation 19 consultation is a decision of full council. It's not an executive decision. And therefore the Constitution does not require it to go through the scrutiny process. This is an additional opportunity which has been provided for members with a greater opportunity to consider, question and understand the plan and its evidence. Full council will take place on the 27th of January. The same supporting papers will form the agenda item on the local plan for that meeting. This means that all council, councillors will have had the documents for 18 days, with 12 clear working days plus three weekends, more than twice the statutory requirement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mill. Um, 
18, August 2018, 45 minutes uh, before the consultation was due to close, a letter was received um, by the County Council, hand delivered, and uh, in that there was a request for the Council to consider uh, Wolf Fox, uh, the development, potential development of Wolf Fox. Um, being that it's presented and under the Habitat Regulations um, assessments, there is a requirement to consider all reasonable alternatives. And therefore, the County Council decided that that was a reasonable alternative and should be considered. Um, meetings were held, obviously, with the uh, people involved in the Wolf Box to gather their information. The further work has been carried out during the period from August 2018 to until the back end of last year uh, in gathering all the evidence both for Wolf Fox and George's and all the other sites that are brought forward to you. But I have to point out that it's not just about the allocation of sites. This plan is about the policies, and there are very many in here tonight, as, I'm, uh, you, as you'll have read, that uh, will identify what sort of development we want within Rutland over the next uh, 15 years. In particular, there are issues around the uh, design of houses, the um, and, and aspects of climate change, use of water, use of minerals, wide range of, of issues and I, I hope that uh, uh, members will in fact look at those as well as the site allocations. It's not just about site allocations, it's about the whole plan uh, and I'd ask you to look at that this evening. I think I, I'll finish at that chair. Anything else to answer around some more questions? I think the key thing for us in terms of presenting this plan is, um, is to make sure it meets the test of standards and so uh, it's gone through a rigorous process in terms of its evidence base, it's gone through a rigorous process in terms of the appraising and uh, assessment of the site. Yeah. It is supported by uh, habitat regulations assessment, it's supported by a sustainability assessment uh, with carried out the quality impact assessment, uh, screening audit and such on. Uh, it uh, conforms to national policy, it, it conforms to its legal requirements on that basis. Thank you very much, Mr. Members of the panel, I'm sure you have a number of uh, questions. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Peggy, as I saw you first. Very well, kind, thank you, Chair. Um, it is a long document, and to show that I've spent the time, I've taken time off work every day since this was published, and squirreled myself away in the members' room at the back, um, going through this page by page. So I do feel very well versed in the detail. My questions are around, mainly around the process that give this plan validity and how do we make this plan sound because that I think is what's key for the council going forward. So I've tried to distill them down into 10 questions, which I'll go through one at a, one at a time if I may. Firstly, how did the portfolio holder demonstrate to me and the committee and the public that the full local planning process has been adhered to and that any legal challenge will not find fault? Has legal advice been taken on the plan process to ensure this happens? Do you want to ask all your questions and then we hand sure. over, or do you want to do it one by one? One by one would, would okay. make more Thank sense. You. Thank you, Chair. I prefer one by one as well, because I think it's more appropriate to answer each question and understand the, the answer. And if it's supplementary, then the, clearly the uh, uh, council can ask that at the stage. Um, Thank you for uh, advising me in advance of the questions and my colleagues. So we've been able to make sure that we have, for all of the questions, uh, clear answers. The evidence base which underpins the local plan has been commissioned by the council using technical specialists recognised as experts in the field. I think it's very important to understand. I think I said at the last scrutiny meeting that the strategic housing market assessment um, was done by a company called Justin Gardner who are recognised as the number one company in the country for doing that work and recognised because of their expertise and the quality of their work. And that's the case with uh, all the consultants we've used, we've all we've used and the technical specialists. They are professional planning people uh, comprising of experienced and or dedicated officers. Um, and I've considered the implications or recommendations of all the technical advice, evidence to prepare a plan which is considered sound. And I was the point that Roger made earlier, sorry, Mr. Ransom made earlier, in accordance with the tests set out in the National Planning Policy Framework. 
Um, the development of a local plan has included appropriate legal advice at each step, including a process for today, and I'm confident that we will, in fact, achieve legal compliance at this stage, uh, and that's all been fully complied with. So I think we have checked, we have made sure that at each stage the, uh, this has been checked out from a legal standpoint, and that's been external legal advice, not just from our own legal officer. The potential for a legal challenge is always a possibility and not something we can prevent. We can, however, mitigate and reduce the risk of a successful challenge. The legal challenge process looks at procedural <coughs> issues in terms of how decisions are made and whether a decision is made reasonable and proportionate. It is important, therefore, we put the Council in the best position to defend any such challenge by demonstrating that the process that has been followed is in accordance with the law and the guidance and that all the evidence um, before us. The examination of public is process is designed to consider these issues as part of their process. This period, sorry, the statutory process does not, however, include a six week legal challenge period after the decision to adopt the plan, following examination in, in public. This period does provide the opportunity for people to challenge the examination process and the inspector's decisions. Again, on the same basis, procedural, reasonableness and proportion of decisions in light of the evidence available. It's possible, therefore, that the decision to adopt a plan could be challenged. Any challenger would have to demonstrate they have an arguable case in order for the case to be heard. Thank you. Are you happy with that answer? Can I just ask one supplementary question at the back of that? Um, what, if you, if you can quantify this, is the financial risk to RCC of any legal challenge? And have we got a contingency um, for that happening? Uh, it is difficult to estimate any specific um, uh, value of a legal challenge. It depends how uh, deep the pockets of those who are challenged wish to go and how far they wish to go. However, having said that, the Council does have um, <coughs> the reserves for legal challenges. And I think uh, you will see that in the, the bunch of papers that come forward to, to members. Uh, thank you. Are you satisfied with that? Yes, thank you. As, uh, I am not inclined to keep going back over ground that we've covered. And so as a consequence, is there anybody else on the panel who's got anything they wish to ask or any comment yeah. they wish to make on this very specific point? Fine, thank you. Mr. Beckett, your next question then. Question two. Um, a recent letter from yesterday, back from the Wolf Fox bid, quotes from exempt papers, which is commercially sensitive. How has this happened? What steps have been taken to seek redress? Uh, thank you, Mr. Beckett. Um, we don't think that the papers are actually exempt. Uh, in particular, there is a, a paper relating to employment that is on the St George's Rutland website. Uh, it is, in fact, unfortunately, a, a, an early version of a paper uh, written in November 2018. Uh, and if you look into the more recent evidence, it has been updated. So, on that point, the, the, the comment I was referring to was about the, um, the infrastructure and the question I'll come on to later about having to meet any overspend on infrastructure, which was a condition, potentially, which was exempt. I think uh, Mr. that references the cabinet report or the, the scrutiny panel report where it does mention uh, in that uh, paper, I think in paragraph 5.2, it was, was it 5.2? Um, if you give me time, I'll go and find it for you. I will not waste time now, I'll refer to that to myself. I'll find it. it. Sorry? It's, it's, it's 5.2, but in fact, the next paragraph in the um, uh, the scrutiny report, the cabinet report, actually explains that, and I think that's where that's been taken from. Thank you. Well, my, ne my next question is actually virtually supplementary to that, but it does go on that condition. If the PIF fund does not cover the total cost of the infrastructure, how will that shortfall be met? Um, slightly careful here, since the, as you know, we had the HIF um, conditions were part of the scrutiny panel at the last time, and we did discuss this to some extent. Um, the risk to the council um, is, is decided not to do all, sorry, the HIF money is not to do all the infrastructure, it's to do specific infrastructure. 
and in particular infrastructure first. That's the whole point of this gift money, is about infrastructure first. It is to fund the gap in the normal development cost between Section 106 and SIL funding. Um, the local plan has been subject to a whole plan viability study, and this includes assumptions for normal development costs, so site preparation, construction costs, fees, developers' return, etc., plus SIL and 106 costs. And that's covered in Chapter 7 of the Viability Report, uh, updated on December 2019. This has assumed that a Section 106 payment contribution of £26,000 per unit for uh, Section 106, in addition to the full SIL payment, which is estimated to be uh, 16 million at today's values. But each year the SIL value is uh, increased by the uh, figure related to the, uh, the, the cost index, the building cost index. Thank you. Uh, this is in addition to the HIF funding, and the HIF funding has been identified specifically for certain pieces of work. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I think that was a very thorough answer and does actually reinforce what was said to us when um, the HIF bid was being discussed in this chamber back in January last <coughs> year. Um, does anybody else have any questions pertaining to HIF, bearing in mind that that's actually in parts of the uh, debate on Monday coming? My question nine is virtually supplementary, so I'll just go straight into that. If, and I say if, since George Barrett did go ahead, can I confirm infrastructure such as schools, doctors, roads, etc., will go in up front, and how is this viable at an, uh, such an early stage of the development? Uh, I, I think, um, first of all, there's information in the uh, infrastructure development, or the infrastructure delivery plan, which has been published along with the papers for the meeting on, uh, uh, on the 27th. But policy H2 requires a detailed master plan to be prepared and approved by the local planning authority prior to consideration of a planning application. This requires the provision of a range of community facilities. Um, H3, policy H3, no, paragraph 3, and the phasing plan H3, paragraph 10, which ensures that on and off site infrastructure is provided ahead of or in tandem with the development it supports. In addition to policy H3, setting out the planning applications must be in accordance with the master plan, uh, and that is the evolving master plan, I must stress that, it's not a new master plan, I understand there are some questions around that, but it's the, the evolving master plan that's already been created and we're, we're evolving with the uh, subgroups that are currently in operation. Um, it must be in accordance with the master plan, approved under policy H2, which is in front of you, and must meet 18 criteria, which includes the need for these community facilities, in H3, C and D, and the need for all on and off-site infrastructure to be delivered in a timely manner. H3R is setting out in the phasing plan. The proposed policies and the uh, approach to the majority development in the local plan is considered to be sound. The existing school at Edith Weston, for example, has capacity to accommodate quite a few additional pupils in the short term, arising from the initial phase of housing development. And this will be considered as part of the determining phasing plan required for these policies. Uh, the award of the HIF fund covers the initial infrastructure and site works, but itself will unlock development funding to deliver the key community facilities in the phase of development. It is not expected that community facilities will be the only things built in the first phase. As with employment land, there is a need to ensure that some homes are also built in the same first phase, to ensure that there are some children to go to the school and patients for the health centre and people to make the shops viable. If there are no homes, these facilities will not function. So it's a question of phasing between the homes and the facilities in that early phase of the development. So just so I'm 100% clear on that, we are saying the infrastructure such as the doctors, the hospitals, the doctors, the schools, etc., will be built up front and won't be an afterthought at the end of the development. I'm happy to answer that. As you know, in many of these large developments, 60% of the development takes place before facilities like that are provided. In this case, the objective is to deliver those at the early stages of the development. And in particular, uh, the road infrastructure, which comes back to the, the County Council, will be one of the very early phases um, in, in the development, if the development goes ahead. So the answer is yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, for the benefit of uh, public who are here, uh, Mr. Brown made reference to 
subgroups. Um, the subgroups are the subgroups of the St. George's Project Board. Uh, there are a number of them. The parish council representatives sit on them or have been invited to sit on them. And they are looking at issues such as uh, highways, the design of the uh, uh, site itself, the master plan, as was mentioned, and uh, also employment. I thought I needed to clarify that from the public's point of view. Sure. May I just add to that? Because I think it's important that the, the it's a design and layout, um, it's transport and public transport, it is uh, uh, health, wealth, and health, well being, and dementia. And it's also education. There are, there are five subgroups in total. Uh, yes, you're quite right. I was trying to do a quick summary of the sort of thing we were looking at rather than the detail. Um, uh, can I ask whether this is in relation to the question that Mr. Brown has just answered, Ms. Robson? Well, I've been asked uh, some, to ask some questions on behalf of the Council of Germans. Indeed. And, and this one does touch on that. It, I want to take them, I want to group them, so if it's about that, yes, then that's Okay, because uh, uh, Councillor Jones is concerned with regards to affordable housing. Uh, we haven't touched on affordable okay. housing yet. We are still talking about health facilities, schools, that type. So if anybody's got anything further on that, then fine. But if not, we'll let Mr. Beggy get to the end of his. Okay. You will get your chance, Mr. Yeah, Robinson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm a great lover of Rutland and its environment, so why are we so confident that SGB has no impact on the Rutland water campsite? <coughs> I'm going to invite, uh, do you mind if I invite uh, can, uh, some strong to uh, respond to that? Anybody 
else any questions on that issue? Uh, Mr. Begley, can you come to the end of yours or he's just more? Please, go ahead. Bear with me, Jen. Why do we feel St George's employment land is attractive to potential employers? What is being undertaken to secure the employment opportunity? Will the employment be from day one <coughs> days throughout the process? Uh, Mr Hensley, you're answering this one for us. I believe so. Um, <coughs> just a bit closer. Um, the local plan proposes a total allocation of 14 hectares of employment land as part of St George's Garden Village. And this is based on the local plan evidence base and meets the long-term anticipated requirement for employment land over a plan period from 2030, 2036 and beyond. Uh, both the whole plan viability assessment for the local plan in December 2019 and the BBP Regeneration Employment Strategy in December 2018 demonstrate the employment land is deliverable as part of the overall St George's Master Plan environment. We do recognise that there is a need for public sector investment and intervention in order to bring forward and deliver the employment zone at the outset of the development and as part of the infrastructure first approach. We are working closely with partners such as Greater Cambridge and Greater Peterborough Combined Authority to identify and secure <coughs> and accelerate delivery of the employment of St George's. Hope that helps. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Vicky? Um, not quite sure to answer the question. Um, my question was, why would employers find the area attractive and what is being undertaken to actually